All right. Welcome to Mortgage Device Axon Tech Talk webinar. My name is Jeffrey Tan, and I'm the product manager of Axon Electrophysiology Product and Molecular Devices, and I will be your host today. So today, it is my honor of having Dr. Lawrence Friends, who will talk about the use of Exoclam 908 in her research. Let me introduce Dr. Lawrence French to you. She, she received her bachelor degrees from Oberlin College and her PhD degree from Cornell University. Her background is in ion channel physiology, uh, physiology using Senopus oocytes as an expression system to, character, to characterize probabilities of different potassium channels, spice forms, and fluorescence imaging of ion channel in situ. She is currently an associate professor and chair of the biology department at Allegheny College, a small liberal arts college in Western Pennsylvania that has a strong focus on undergraduate teaching and research. Her main research project has involved in Senapus oocyte expression system as a way to screen Connors Winnums for ion channel targeting activity. The topic of her, pres her presentation today is using the exoclam 9 a for two electro voltage clamp of Senapus oocyte expressing ion channels to characterize Connor's snail venom's actions. So in this webinar, Dr. Lawrence Friends will focus the techniques of two electro voltage clamp and also focus how to conduct two electro voltage clamp and how to optimize the data analysis with Exocrem 900A, and she also will further discuss the challenge and rewards of teaching undergraduate and undergraduate to do this this work. So I want to repeat again: you can submit your question at any time during the webinar in the Q and A boxes, and you just hit the you know submit the send button. So before uh, I turn to uh, Dr. French Lawrence, I want to introduce a little bit about the Exocrem 900A. And 900A is an ideal amplifier for two electro voltage clamp and current clamp recording, for example, for oocyte and a muscle cell. And it is a computer control with two HESTE attached. So for the Exocrem 900A, we not only for two electro voltage clamp, we also can do like current clamp and also with the discontinuous current clamp for accurate voltage measurement. And also we also can do discontinuous single electro voltage clamp for small cell with large current. And you can also use 900A for uh, antiphoresis too. So we in this seminar, we also over the quick saving to uh, all the audience uh, in, in this webinar. So please contact, if you are in North America, please contact Jackie Flowers. And if you are in Europe, please uh, contact Chicho Vita for this grieving, risk saving opportunity. Then now I will hand the board to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lawrence French. I just there. Are you seeing my desktop now? Jeffrey, can you see my? Are yep. you sharing? I can, can see, see you. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. I can see. So we're ready to go then. Thank All right. You. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to to be here today. Um, as Jeffrey said, um, I'm at Allegheny College, which is a four-year liberal arts college. We have 2,100 students. Um, it is all undergraduate. Um, there are no graduate students, and so this prevent, presents uh, challenges. Uh, and, and as a faculty member, balancing, we have a lot of the main emphasis is on teaching. But we also have active research programs here and really try to incorporate the students into our research programs as much as possible, um, both uh, because this is how you teach people to be real scientists, uh, to make that transition from learning in the classroom from a textbook to doing science, the active part of doing science. How do you ask experimental questions, how do you conduct experiments, analyze them, and communicate your findings. All of that is so, is so vital to science education. 
Um, and to sort of complement that, Allegheny has a required senior project, which is a year-long independent research project, um, usually based on a faculty member's area of expertise or you know, somewhat related. And so um, in the, especially in the science curricula, we have research built in so that students can learn how to do these things and so that they're prepared for their senior project and, and beyond. Um, and so incorporating one's own research into courses and other work with students really benefits both the faculty and the students alike. And um, so as you can see from the title, um, my main focus is um, with uh, ion channels and using conus venom. I have a few other projects. Um, but actually today, uh, after I give a little intro to this, as Jeffrey said, the main focus of this talk uh, will be on the sort of the technical uh, aspects of using the, the AxaClamp equipment um, and the how, you know, kind of step-by-step how-to instructions. Um, at the end of the talk, I will have my contact information. Um, if anybody has questions uh, for me or wants access to information I talk about, you should feel free to contact me after the webinar. I also, you can also get a hold of information about this um, uh, presentation through the Molecular Devices website. So cone snails, um, for people who are not familiar with them, are a predatory genus of snail, which is kind of an odd thing in itself. Um, they're really fascinating. Um, this shows several different views, including uh, for some scale there, the different, they have lovely shells. There are over 700 species of these snails. And um, they live in the ocean, but they don't swim, and they're snails, so they're rather slow. Uh, so it's, it's on, at, at the onset, it's kind of, or the outset, it's, it's kind of a mystery as to how they could hunt anything that doesn't die on top of them. But they actually uh, make up for these shortcomings by having an incredibly potent venom. Um, each, each species has a unique venom that comprises hundreds if not thousands of small uh, peptides and other molecules that target nervous system proteins with unmatched uh, specificity. Um, and Dr. Baldomero Oliveira has really pioneered this work in uh, the natural biology of the snails as well as the biochemistry of the venom and the uh, uh, pharmacological uh, applications of the, the venom. And, and I collaborate uh, with his lab on this, on this project. So I use the Xenopus lavis oocyte expression system to express RNA encoding ion channels uh, that I'm interested in and screen those uh, ion channels with conus venom. Uh, when we find a venom that affects an ion channel, for example, it could potentiate the current, it could inhibit the current, um, the uh, people in, in Dr. Oliveira's lab um, fractionate the venom by HPLC, um, and we continue to perform our assays to narrow down to the single active component. Um, as I mentioned briefly, these, the, the venom components are, are very useful in both research and, and potentially as pharmaceuticals. Um, for example, the, the, the peptides are often referred to as conotoxins, and um, many conotoxins are used to characterize specific channels because they can recognize, they target very specifically um, uh, individual splice forms of channels and, and can make other distinctions that other pharmacological agents are unable to do. On the pharmaceutical side, there's a, a story, uh, one of the earlier projects from Dr. Oliveira's lab that I understand was done in conjunction with an undergraduate student in his lab um, that led to the development of a drug which is on the market, I believe, since 2004 called Ziconotide or Prealt. This is a synthetic conotoxin that targets N-type calcium channels, and it, that is the same channel that is downstream of the opiate receptor uh, pathway. Um, so in some circumstances, this, this drug can be used as an alternative to morphine. So there are great, um, great applications, as I mentioned, both in, in research and in uh, the clinical side of things for the cone snail venom. So in doing this work, screening, um, uh, channels in oocytes. I'm going to go over the methods briefly. Um, this, uh, the first part of the methods involves molecular biology uh, techniques because one has to prepare the RNA uh, in order to inject it. And so um, this part I will go over uh, just briefly. Um, 
uh, one needs to prepare template DNA that encodes the ion channel. So we do mini prep, um, uh, mini preps of plasmid DNA with the clone. We linearize the DNA with uh, restriction endonucleases, purify that DNA to uh, have template ready DNA, and then we in vitro transcribe it. At which point it becomes called, uh, it becomes known as, as copy RNA, cRNA. Uh, and then we surgically isolate the oocytes from Xenopus lavis, uh, African clawed frog. And down here you can see a picture of oocytes. On the left in panel A here are some nice healthy looking oocytes. The, these cells are about a millimeter in diameter. You can see that they have two uh, poles to them. There's a dark pole, which is the uh, animal pole, and the lighter pole, which is the, the vegetal pole. These cells on the right show some less than optimal cells, which is um, which is a, a, a concern, and um, we'll come back to that later. Um, after isolating and, and culturing the oocytes, we inje micro inject the cRNA and allow anywhere from three to five days for expression, depending on the clone we're using. And you can just see a, a visual cartoon of that that was developed by uh, a student of mine who's now a graduate student at uh, Cornell in uh, New York City. Um, so we inject the, the RNA, and after a few days, the oocyte serves as a protein factory and makes those channels for us. And then the channels can be uh, analyzed and, uh, by electrophysiology, which brings us to the main topic for today, um, the two-electrode voltage clamp using the AXA clamp uh, system. Uh, this is a photograph from our teaching lab. We have four rigs uh, with uh, the AXA clamp uh, set up, little product placement right here, um, the AXA clamp 900A, and the Digidata that allows it to communicate with the computer. Um, also, you can see in this rig, we have a, a homemade uh, Faraday cage and homemade uh, vibration isolation unit, which is, is really with cells this big. Um, this is all you need. You don't, uh, you don't really need a, 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 an air table. Um, so what we have here is the legs of the Faraday cage are stuck in coffee cans that are filled with sand. And on top of the, the surface of the table, there is a layer of granite. And on top of that is a, is a slab of steel. In between them, which you can't really see at this angle, are um, inner tubes, uh, tire, tractor tire inner tubes that provides a little bit of a cushion. And this is all the, the vibration isolation that we actually need for this. Okay, so um, the oocytes are a really good teaching model and a good expression system for this project. It enables us to study ion channels uh, separately in isolation, um, and then ultimately we can, can uh, bring those studies, bring the information that we learn back into um, real neurons uh, and in vivo uh, setups. Um, so here we have a close-up of an oocyte in a recording dish. Uh, this is a recording dish that we made here for our uh, conotoxin studies. This is a three milliliter um, petri dish, and it's filled with seal guard um, into which a little we've made a pool um, to have a small recording volume. I, I, I should mention that this particular recording dish is not. It's not vital to uh, two electrode voltage clamp in general. This is just for our purposes with the, the cone snail venom. Um, one can also use a seal guard in a, in a um, petri dish and use a plastic mesh. Um, I believe we had some for some, we, it was originally for some needlework or something. It was a, just a plastic mesh that you get at a craft store that has openings that are about a millimeter in diameter. And so you can fasten the mesh to the seal guard with insect pins, and that also creates a, a perfectly um, uh, usable uh, recording dish. So lots of homemade tools and things here. Um, so you can see the close-up of the oocyte and the, the two electrodes. Um, it's really a, a good way to teach students. It's, the, the cells are large, uh, easier for them to get the electrodes in there um, and to learn the basics of, of um, recording while collecting real data. Um, I use these techniques both in my junior seminar course, which is called Cellular Neurobiology. Uh, the junior seminar here at Allegheny is a, a transition um, where students are moving away from the 
sort of introductory classroom setting of uh, science where you're working from a textbook and memorizing vocabulary and things like that. Um, the junior seminar, we work with primary literature, and there is a lab to teach uh, particular areas of expertise. Um, and so in my case, I'm, I'm teaching the students these techniques so that they can use them in their senior project research. We do use the injected oocytes, uh, injected with RNA, because I have the lab set up to allow for that. Um, in my upper level neuroscience class called neurophysiology, which is a, a kind of a, a cellular molecular neuroscience course, um, in that course, it, it's not practical to use injected oocytes uh, because of the timing of the labs. So I actually do an experiment that I call the chocolate oocyte experiment. It's a, an idea I, I got from uh, Dr. Rona DeLay at University of Vermont um, to uh, olfactory uh, system physiologists, Drs. Blair and Dion in 1988 actually discovered that um, cocoa powder uh, can potentiate the current from the endogenous calcium activated chloride channels that the oocytes contain. Um, and this uh, wasn't, wasn't so practical for their purposes uh, studying olfactory receptors, but it does make a really great tool for the classroom. And I will come back to that uh, a little bit later. The computer-based operations in the, the newest versions of, the, of AxoClamp and PClamp um, are really useful, and I'm going to go through kind of step-by-step -step instructions. I will show you some screenshots from the AxoClamp operator and the PClamp window. PClamp is the software that accompanies um, the AxoClamp and, and Digidata system, uh, makes it easier to record uh, data and also to analyze later on. Um, I have, I think I mentioned this before, I have step-by-step -step instructions uh, for doing the, the voltage clamp experiments, for analyzing data, um, and I can make those available to people if they're interested. I will also, uh, Jeffrey and I discussed, I will share them with him to publish on the MDS website to make those um, available for people. Um, but I will just kind of go over the basics here. Um, so this is an example of what the uh, AxoClamp operator looks like, um, and I, I find that the computer-based operations are, um, I find they're a lot easier for me to use. They're also a lot less intimidating for the students, because the students are used to doing everything on the computer, and so that's not as big a, a shift for them as using all of you know, the previous versions where all the buttons and dials were on the, the amplifier itself. So once you have your electrodes uh, in the dish, as you saw in the previous slide here, uh, the first step is to, to zero them. And when you first open this window and you reset defaults here, um, this button would be live uh, and you could click on zero. And since I'm currently under the iClamp 1, I'm, I'm in current clamp mode, so measuring voltage, um, and, uh, and the one refers to head stage one, so the first electrode. So I'd be able to zero that. Uh, then I could click over to the second electrode, head, the iClamp 2 tab, which connects to head stage two, and do the same thing. I can unlock if necessary and zero the pipette. Then uh, the next step is to check the resistance of the electrodes. Uh, two electrode voltage clamp uses very low resistance electrodes, so we're looking, the ideal resistance is anywhere between uh, 0.5 and 5 mega ohms, and it's very easy to, uh, uh, to check the resistance of the electrodes. You simply check, you click on the, the proper tab for the electrode you're, you're interested in, check the box for resistance and it appears right here. Um, I should note in these, in these uh, examples that I'm showing, there was a, a model cell uh, attached, so just a, an RC circuit that was uh, attached to this. So these are not, uh, this is not an actual biological cell, but it gets the point across. Um, I also should mention that we, with these large uh, electrodes, the low resistance, we do not use the pipette capacitance neutralization. So as soon as we open this, we kind of check off of of that box um, immediately. So one checks the resistance, and if that's acceptable, um, one's ready to go. And you put the, the oocyte in, and you impale the oocyte um, 
with each electro with one electrode at a time and check for the membrane potential. Um, and the panel right here makes it easy to see when you've impaled the uh, the oocyte. This will switch from the zero number to something ideally more negative. And um, we are generally looking for um, with if it, if the cell is is healthy, then you you want want a more hyperpolarized potential. So usually we look for something. Uh, minus 20 millivolts and uh, and hopefully even more hyperpolarized than that. And once we check that with each um, with each electrode, have both electrodes measuring the membrane potential, then we are ready to switch into uh, to the voltage clamp tab. So we would click on this tab, and we're going to focus over on stick with the axle clamp operator window right here, and then we'll switch. Um, to this other uh, this other shot here, so in in this in the operator, you can see that I've got the two electrode voltage clamp selected. Before we would actually switch up here, we would want to adjust our holding potential, and we would set that to uh, at first the membrane potential of the cell that we have. I just put it to zero since this is a, a, a model cell, um, and down here in these um, in this window down here, these numbers that are blue. Um, in the in the, using the axle clamp system, when you scroll over them with the mouse, they turn red, and you can use the the scroll wheel on the mouse to scroll to to adjust numbers up and down, or you can double click and enter the number by hand. So here I've entered zero millivolts again, since this is a a, a model cell, and checked on the the holding. So when I click the TVC button. Then we go into voltage clamp mode, in which case the head stage one is recording the membrane potential, and we on head stage two, we use that to check the holding current, so how much current it takes to hold um, the cell at a given membrane potential. Ideally, when one is using real um, oocytes uh, and holding at um, fairly hyperpolarized potentials, uh, one wants the holding current to be as low as possible. Um, it, it, higher holding currents are usually indicative of um, less healthy cells, and if it takes a lot of, you know, if it takes almost, you know, 100 nanoamps to hold the cell at minus 60, uh, then it gets difficult to trust the data as you depolarize. So, um, in an ideal situation, you have a healthy cell, have a, a holding current that's nice and low, and you're ready to go to the next step, which is uh, a technique that we call um, tuning the clamp. Um, this is a, a calibration step, and this is where um, I was discussing that um, there's a, a there are some challenges in, in translating from engineer speak to biology speak. Um, so I'll certainly explain the, the tuning the clamp process um, um, as, as I understand it, and, and, and Jeffrey can can add to that if if, if necessary. Um, the tuning the clamp, what you want, what you're trying to do with voltage clamp is um, the clamp refers to controlling the membrane potential of the cell. And that is the strength of this technique. I deal with voltage gated channels. And so it's, it's a big uh, advantage to me to be able to control the membrane potential of the cell and thereby control the stimulus of the channels I'm working with. So what the system is doing is measuring the, the membrane potential, comparing it to the holding potential, and then if they're different, injecting current um, to adjust it as necessary. Ideally, we want the system to do this as quickly as possible. And adjusting the gain and lag is necessary for that control. Um, so one generally wants the gain to be as high as possible for this process to be efficient. And what is involved there, um, I would initially set this, if I were doing a real experiment, I would set this to 200 to begin with, a nice low number. Um, and I would set a seal test pulse to 50 millivolts. So I would check this box, uh, set this to 50 millivolts. And what that does is deliver a square wave and what we're seeing here is the ClampX window. This is part of P-Clamp. ClampX is one of the, the um, uh, programs in that, in that software. 
Um, and I'm running a gap-free program, which is a, a, just a computerized oscilloscope. And so what one sees is in the, the top window here, the voltage window, is a square pulse and the, and the current trace and below. And what you do initially when you start this with a very low gain of 200, um, this would look round. Um, it would look very rounded. And what you would do is go to the gain and scroll up until this becomes nice and square. Uh, and you just keep advancing the gain. Ideally, you want it as high as possible. With real oocytes, we try to get it up into the at least 1,000 and, if, if, and hopefully higher. Um, what you're looking out for is you want to avoid um, oscillations. So when you hit sort of a, a current resonance frequency in the, in the cell, um, you can see current waves back and forth, and that, that can be damaging to the cell and not very productive for recording. So at that point, you would lower the gain if you see that. And in a healthy cell, uh, when things are going well, um, and I should, should mention that how, how high you can set the gain and how well the system works is dependent on a number of things, including the health of the cell you're working with, um, how how well it was impaled, you know, if you if if you were able to gently impale the oocytes, or if it's uh, the, with the electrodes, um, or if there's you know a bit of a hole torn in it. Um, it also depends on the shape uh, and the position and the resistance of the electrodes in the cell. Uh, all those things contribute to how how high the gain can go, how efficiently the the clamp uh, can operate. So occasionally, if, if things are not, if the situation is not ideal, um, so normally I would start by setting the lag to uh, 0.2 milliseconds. And if I'm not able to get the gain as high as I would like, I sometimes try to increase the lag a little bit. And this, I believe, is involved in the timing of, of how the, uh, the system compares the voltage and adjust it, adjusts it. And so using the combination of those two things, you try to optimize the square wave, and then that gives you um, a clamp that should be efficient, and one is ready to run the protocol. Um, one feature I really like about the, uh, the P-clamp system is that it automatically saves the data and give, gives it a date stamp. So for example, up here, you can see this is 1-4 for 2014, 5 one This is from May 1st. Zero, zero, zero. That's the first um, the first file, and as if I were to continue to record, it would just keep adding on to that, and so um, and that's nice, and especially when you're um, dealing with students, uh, to know that their their data are going to be saved uh, automatically is is quite helpful. So in this slide, this is another view of just the Clampex window, uh, an example um, from uh, last year showing uh, one of the voltage protocols that we run uh, in, in, in uh, ClampX. And this is to record from a voltage-gated calcium channel. And this voltage window, you can see uh, the protocol. What we do here is we hold at minus 60 millivolts. Then we hyperpolarize to minus 100 for, for a second. Um, and then we depolarize. This hyperpolarizing step is necessary for when you're working with uh, inactivating uh, channels. Uh, it's necessary to hyperpolarize first to make sure they're capable of being activated. So each run of the program involves starting at minus 60, going down to minus 100, and then depolarizing to successively more depolarized potentials in 10 millivolt incre increments. So our first depolarizing step is to minus 50. The most depolarized is to positive 40. And then you collect the current that is passing across the, the, the membrane here. You get a current versus time trace down here. And this is a recording, as I said, from a voltage-gated calcium channel. So you can see the um, characteristic inward uh, current uh, here. This is, this is a little bit of a small current, but it was a good example um, to show. Okay, let's see if I've gotten through the gain. Um, and I should also say in my um, 
the step-by-step -step instructions that I have, I also make note, uh, I call attention to things that students should write down, the information that they need to make note of, um, because they're things I'm going to ask them later. What was the resistance of your electrode? What was the holding current? What was the maximum current that you saw? Was the was the clamp decent? Um, you know, was the trace noisy? Those types of things. So I I indicate to them um, the type of information uh, that they need to to write down. After the recording is completed, then one comes out of voltage clamp, makes sure the, the cell is still uh, alive, recheck the electrodes, and then uh, you're set to go on to the, next, uh, to the next cell and proceed that way. The P-clamp uh, information, uh, the P-clamp software also has a program called Clamp Fit, which is helpful for data analysis. Um, one can collect uh, current data and I'm going to move on to showing some of the, the data that are, have been collected by my students. Um, and, and I can talk a bit more about the data analysis that we do. Uh, this slide shows the data from Laura Steele. She's an undergraduate who will be graduating from Allegheny uh, this Saturday. Um, and this is from her senior project. She was working with a voltage-gated potassium channel called KV4.2. It's in the Shaker family. Um, a mammalian version, and this clone was generally, generously given to us by Dr. Robert Barring of the University of Hamburg. And you can see the characteristic outward current, um, the transient outward current from KV4.2 um, is showing five, about five microamps at peak, uh, uh, peak current at uh, positive 40 millivolts. In the bottom panel is a, a water-injected oocyte. That's what we do for a, a control, is inject uh, oocytes with the same volume of water as uh, the volume of RNA that we have used. And the clamp fit program is useful for many things. Um, you can ask it to give you the peak current values, the time at which that peak current occurs. You can use it to fit. Um, to fit certain parts of the of the the current trace to uh, to analyze the kinetics of the of the recordings, um, and um, and that's that's very helpful as well. The oocytes, as you can see, they do have endogenous current. It's um, mostly a calcium activated chloride current, so it also yields an outward current, but it is non inactivating. It's generally only a few hundred nanoamps at the largest. Um, and um, what we do when we analyze our data is we subtract the water injected currents from the RNA injected because we're not interested in, this, in these experiments and measuring the calcium activated chloride current. And we also do a tech, we also normalize our data because you can see that in this oocyte, there's a lot of current, peak amplitude of five microamps, but that absolute uh, current number can vary greatly from oocyte to oocyte, and that can have more to do with the, the frog egg characteristics than the gene itself. So one oocyte may have a peak current of five microamps, another one may have a, a, a peak current of one. Um, and so what we do with our data is to, after we water subtract, we take the peak, for each oocyte, we take the peak current um, and we divide the current at each um, voltage step by that peak current. And so when we make our IV plots for, for these types of experiments, we're showing fractions of, of, of current. Um, you know, the peak current, of course, being one. And that more easily enables us to compare across oocytes um, and to also compare when we add venom. So Laura Steele was uh, using a Conus Venom. Uh, this is a newer project in the lab, and so she was starting to screen with, with crude venom um, to, see, to look for something to affect the KB4.2 channel. This slide is from uh, Jackie DeCourcy, another um, senior graduating uh, this week. Um, this is a, a project that's further along. Um, this is involving the CAV 3.2 channel. This is a voltage-gated calcium channel. It's a T-type channel. Um, this uh, is, is, was given to us and is a collaboration with Dr. Leanne Cribbs at Loyola University, also an alum of Allegheny. 
Um, and she generously gave us this clone. And you can see here Jackie is showing the, she's just showing the um, minus 50 millivolt step and showing the pre-venom condition and the post-venom uh, condition. Um, this venom inhibits the, the channel current. And Jackie, her senior project was focused on narrowing down to the individual component that, um, that is, is accomplishing this inhibition that you can see in the slide. Um, you can also see this is another feature, another thing that you can do using clamp fit is to just isolate specific uh, traces um, and edit them in, in different ways to, you know, to, to display your data. Okay. This um, is an example of an IV plot. This is from the, the chocolate oocyte experiment that I, I mentioned, just another application of, of two electrode voltage clamp. This is a class exercise, and this is a, a graph taken from a, a lab report that was submitted just this semester, just a week or two ago. Um, these are the data of, of Agnes Marcos, Hannah Phillips, and Ryan Pearson. They're all, all seniors, although there are, I also have juniors in this, in this class. So the, what they did was just use non-injected oocytes and record the endogenous current that you saw a few slides back. And then they applied a saturated cocoa solution. So this graph shows the current versus voltage. These are not normalized data. These are just um, the absolute current values. So you can see there's, there's quite a bit of difference. Um, the sample size for the cocoa condition as well as the uh, saline, the control, uh, was four oocytes, so this isn't bad. For, you know, I thought this was a really nice example from a, a, a class activity. Um, this group, they thought themselves, the 400 microliter saline condition, they decided themselves that, you know, that applying the cocoa to the, the dish was, uh, it was very difficult to do without disturbing the um, oocyte recording. So they took it upon themselves to do what they called a sham saline injection, where they added 100 microliters of saline. And you can see that those two controls overlap, so you can barely tell that there are two. And you can see that the cocoa potentiates the current quite a bit. And this makes for a nice exercise. It's, uh, it is not known what component in the cocoa does this or what the mechanism is precisely. I'm, I'm hoping to have uh, some students work on that in the future. Um, at this point, I'd, I'd like to address, um, you know, as Jeffrey said, uh, the challenges and rewards of working with undergraduates. There are lots of each of those. So um, the challenges of working with uh, undergraduates and doing this type of work. Um, this is a very resource-intensive project, and by resources I mean uh, the equipment, the techniques involved, the time for both training the students as well as, as data collection. Um, and with regards to the, the uh, equipment, I'd just like to say that I, um, when I first got to Allegheny, I did try. Um, I, I had other equipment from a different company, which I won't mention right now, <laughs> um, that uh, it was less expensive, but it was a total disaster. It really just wasn't up to the quality of doing real research. And so since I had used Axon and then uh, molec now molecular devices equipment, I really wanted to use that with my students. Um, and it, that's challenging for a, a school. I mean, I think budgets are tight all over, but certainly um, smaller schools have smaller budgets. And so that was a challenge to get um, four rigs worth of equipment. And I was able to do it through the generosity of MDS. They loaned me equipment. Um, I bought the, the, rig, the equipment and the software for the rigs um, one at a time. So it took me four years to accumulate four rigs worth of, of equipment. Um, but MDS loaned me equipment um, to use in my courses so that I didn't have to have one group of students or two groups of students working with uh, molecular devices equipment and two groups of students working with something else. Um, and that really uh, made it possible for me to do this. Um, so I'm very appreciative um, for their support there. Another challenge in working with undergraduates in this type of work is the finesse. Um, in general, but specifically with the, the oocytes, um, the culturing, 
the injecting, the recording. Um, one has to learn how to how to handle them, have the proper sterile technique to be gentle enough with electrodes for just both injecting and recording so that the so the cells survive the whole process, and that definitely takes uh, practice. Electrode issues, you get the students saying, I swear I didn't touch it and the electrode is broken. Yes, okay, you know, that you did touch it somehow. The electrode is very small. Um, getting that uh, idea across and, and teaching the students to make sure that they use the microscope and how to avoid uh, hitting the electrode into, or bumping it into anything um, so that it has the, the proper resistance to go and do their, their recording. Uh, that also takes some time to develop that skill. And of course, learning the, the physics and the physiology behind what they're doing. Um, what's an inward versus an outward current? How does a voltage-gated channel work? What's a good clamp versus a bad clamp? The meaning of holding current? What is resistance? How do you calculate that? Um, there's, a, there's a fair amount of knowledge. I've worked with students um, in, in their first year up to, their, to, up to seniors. Um, some of them come to me and they work in the lab first and learn the, the physics and, the, and the, the neuroscience as they go. Others I have in, in the classroom first and they learn, uh, they learn the, the philosophy behind everything first and then get into the lab. It, it, wor it can work either way um, and um, some students it's, it's easier one way or another, but, um, but it, it works both ways. So there are also many rewards. Um, to doing this work with undergraduates. Um, first of all, I, I, I feel it's necessary just to emphasize that they can do it. I, I, I work, I'm honored to work with um, lots of very bright, talented, uh, motivated students, and they can learn how to do it, and they can do it quite well. And that's why all the data that I've um, shown in, in this presentation, all collected by, by undergraduate students. Um, the one student, Jackie DeCourcy, that I showed the calcium channel figure, she's been working with me since she was a sophomore. Um, and uh, so she is, practice, is like a graduate student at this point and, and happily is going on to graduate school next year. So they can do it. Um, they learn a diverse set of techniques that, uh, and skills that prepares them for many types of labs or careers. Um, they learn molecular biology, they learn animal care and surgery. Um, the surgery is very simple, but it is, you know, that is something that they have to learn. Um, I tell my med school bound students that if they can tie sutures in frog skin, I personally have never met a human that's as slimy as a frog, so that'll set them up well for medical careers too. Micro injection, cell culture, electrophysiology, um, it gives them a really great broad set of, of, of skills for no matter what they uh, in, want to do next. And along with that, um, students learn the, the creativity, uh, the creative side of science um, that's necessary for both troubleshooting as well as experimenting. You know, something didn't work the way you wanted it to or um, you got an, a result that you didn't expect and how do you, how do you test that or how do you make adjustments to um, to find out what, what's going on. Um, it, it comes as a surprise at first to students that, that, that science is actually a creative process. Um, but at the same time, as that it can be a surprise for some students, I also find that having uh, young, new minds uh, doing this, that they, they bring a fresh perspective and can often, they often come up with suggestions that somebody who's been at it for a while might not have thought of. So, um, so that's, you know, that fresh energy is always is, is good. I think it works both ways. It's, it's rewarding for them and it also brings new ideas to me and to my lab. Um, also, I think, you know, there's lots of evidence both in pedagogical research and just those of us who teach just know that um, hands-on learning is, is the most effective way to, to, teach, uh, to teach people. Um, so the, the things that they do in the lab complements the philosophy that's learned in, in classes from textbooks or um, reading papers and things like that. It really, um, the two go hand in hand and the hands-on learning just cements it. They learn how to do science, not just to, to read about it. Um, so those are some of the, the rewards with work, of working with, with undergraduate students. I, I absolutely um, love it. It's my passion. Um, so at this point, I just want to cite, these are some of the, the main references that I cited in, during uh, this presentation. 
Um, and so those are, are here. And as I as I mentioned, my email address is is down below. Um, and uh, listeners should uh, feel free to contact me um, after the the webinar. I'm, I'm happy to to set up more connections and. Um, as Jeffrey mentioned, one of the main purposes of this is to increase communication between scientists, which is what I do for a living and, um, and what I really enjoy. So I thank you very much for your attention. Um, and at this point, if I can figure out, All right. I'll yep. hand so. it back to Jeffrey. Thank you so much. I think this is, it is a wonderful uh, uh, webinar uh, talking about uh, uh, the technique of the two electrical voltage clamp and also how to use exo clamp line step by step. And also you mentioned about the challenge in a small school. So I think this is a wonderful presentation. So I think so, uh, I would like to say um, to uh, ask the audience if you have any question. Please, you can uh, uh, put it in the in the Q uh, Q and A boxes, and I will uh, pick some questions to ask uh, um, uh, Lawrence. So, uh, but I have a one comments on that, and also have a couple questions. The one mm -hmm. comment is that uh, I want to add on to. Uh, I, so I believe that I mean you mentioned about to adjust for the gain and the lag, mm -hmm. right? And that mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. from a biology from biology uh, from biology, you know. Uh, perspective, right? So mm -hmm. I believe that it is a art to optimize uh, the better clamp. Okay, but mm -hmm. let me back up something is that so uh for uh for the audience is that in order to have a better voltage clamp, like Lawrence mentioned that he will use high gain as much mm -hmm. as possible. But the reason behind that I wanted to share the the reason behind for my for my engineering is that the 900A control subtract the cell voltage of the cell voltage memory potential from the command the command that we give it to the cell is multiplied it by the gain by the gain and then applied it back to the you know to the ME2 I mean the the, the second electrode so that's why we like to use the high gain as possible. To have the better, to have the better clamp. Okay. Now, to make the system follow the command as close as possible, as I mentioned, that we have to use much. You hide the gain, uh, use much gain as possible. But unfortunately, unfortunately, you also mentioned that if the gain is too high, the system will oscillate. Right. So that's that's why we add the lag into the system to stabilize it. So that at that time, you you see the the system is oscillate when you try to better the clamp to make the system to a better clamp. That you may want to increase the increase the lag so that so that the system will be stable. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but however, if you use too much lag, the system will be stable but slow. Right, so that's why it really depends on what kind of channel that you are studying. For example, if you are doing like like ligand gated channel, I believe that should be fine for the slow response. But if you do the voltage gate channel, voltage voltage gate sensitive channel, that probably is too slow. That I, I believe that you need to adjust the game and also the land to give you uh, the better clamp. Okay, now I have uh, one question from the audience is that. How do you know whether your voltage clamp is sufficient? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what are your criteria for a decent voltage clamp? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and 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 one certainly that um, my students, you know, I, I go through a lot. Um, whether your voltage clamp is sufficient, I think, um, is it, you know, does, do you have great enough control to hold to to maintain the membrane potential? So in the the figures that I show during my slides, um, you know the the voltage protocol was shown as the square the square uh, waveform that was on top, and that should look nice and square and even. If the ah yeah I see if the um, let's see if I go back um, here. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, you, so you want to share your so your desktop? Oh, sure. yeah. Would that be would that be helpful? Don't worry, I I will, okay. I will give it back to you, right? You can share. Okay. Please share your desktop first, right? Okay. Let's see. Yep. <laughs> All right. There we go. So yep. now you sh you should be able to see this slide, um, and the this is the waveform 
shows the voltage trace, and that's that's why you're able to see it. And you can see there's like a little, you know, there's a little something shaking down there. When it's not a good clamp, this does not look square, and you can see that it, it just kind of looks like a mess. Um, also, if it's kind of rounded on the sides, then it means it's not, it doesn't have full control, and then it's hard to trust the output that you get. Um, and so I think, does that answer the question? All right. Okay. Now, I have another question to ask you about the pipette resistance. So you mentioned about, can, can, can you tell us more about the pipette resistance that you use for injecting the, injecting the the cRNA versus mm -hmm. of the pipette mm -hmm. resistance used for the two electrical right. voltage clamp. Yeah. So for the um, the electrophysiology, we do me we measure the resistance, and so the it's between 0.5 and 5 mega ohms. For injection, we don't have access with the setup that we have. We don't have access to the electronics, um, but we do. Um, we we pull the the electrodes and we actually break them um in a in a specific way um and uh this uh, actually we, I got help from the the company that makes the puller I guess I'm probably not supposed to plug them right now but they've been really helpful um what we do is uh we want a a, a tip diameter that's between about uh 17 and 25 microns. Any bigger than that, it damages the oocyte too much. Smaller than about 15, 17 microns, um, and it's difficult to get the RNA out in and out of the tip. It's too small um, for the RNA. So what we do is um, we actually take a Kim wipe and stretch it over a beaker and just gently poke the freshly pulled electrode through the, um, you know, through the Kim wipe, and that gives a nice angled tip, much like a syringe uh, needle. And the when and then we check the diameter of the tip um, under the microscope, and if it's between about 15 and 25 microns, that's that's usually um, ideal. All right. The last question from the audience is that: Is it possible for high current, such a high current, to kill the cell? <laughs> um. Ye well, yes, yes. Um, we found there were, uh, and in dealing with new uh, clones, you know, uh, channels that I that that I hadn't uh, recorded from before. I'm not sure if the channel current. What can kill the cell is if you get those oscillatory waves that we, that Jeffrey and I were both describing when you're trying to optimize the clamp. Um, that uh, Those can create very high currents and that can ultimately kill the cell. And so that's when you're optimizing the clamp, um, it's important to, um, to watch out for that. And if you do see the oscillations, to lower the gain right away because that, that can kill the cell. All right. So I think uh, uh, so. We uh, at the Q and A section is uh, just done.